Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. I'm here with Doug Woodring, the founder and managing director of Ocean Recovery Alliance, a nonprofit that is focused on improving the health of the ocean. I've been learning just how critical a healthy ocean is for biodiversity and greenhouse gas reduction. So this is an important topic and you can't talk about ocean health without talking about the plastic problem. And that's an area where Doug has particular expertise. According to a UN report, Plastic makes up 85% of marine litter, and despite all the talk about reducing plastic and improving recycling, the quantity in the ocean is expected to triple by 2040. That would mean 50 kilograms of plastic per meter of coastline globally. This is a good topic for our audience because people in the physical product industry can influence material usage and also design for circularity. And also, Doug has some ideas about where new hardware can help solve the problem. To introduce Doug quickly, I'll start by saying that he is a competitive and accomplished open water swimmer, so he experiences ocean health in a more personal way than many of us. What has struck me in the short time I've known him is his passion and dedication to the problem and the diversity of ways in which he has tackled it. So Doug, thank you for joining the show. It's really an honor to have you. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to chat. And I'm excited to learn about open water swimming too. Tell me a little bit about that. I didn't actually say this in the intro, but I saw you were inducted to the Marathon Swimming International Hall of Fame in 2020. Right. Yes. So I actually swam at Berkeley. I I grew up in the Bay Area. I'm a sprinter by training, so I'm not a huge distance swimmer like the English channels and things, but I've lived in Asia over 30 years and the water in Hong Kong is actually great and warm most of the year. You don't need a wetsuit. And after doing a few races in California, the Tahoe crossing and the Maui crossing in Hawaii with relay teams, I said, my gosh, Hong Kong needs one of these. So I, for 15 years, ran the biggest races in Asia, which were the only relay races. Usually open water swimming is solo events, but in a relay, you have a support boat and uh, five or six people on a team and you basically leapfrog. But one of the reasons for the impetus is that it's obviously when you're in the water, a lot of people think of animals and they're afraid of jellyfish and, of course, sharks. And when you're in dirty water, if you're swimming in dirty-ish water or water with plastic in it, if you're swimming along in your zone and all of a sudden a plastic bag comes right in front of you, it gives you almost a heart attack because you (laughs) think it is the mouth of a shark. (laughs) <laughs> and you can't avoid that. And so I've had a few of those cases. I also raced outrigger canoes competitively and internationally. And when you get a plastic bag on your rudder on a surf ski or an outrigger, especially during a race, it's a big bummer. It's like having a parachute open up when you're going 10 or 12 kilometers an hour. So it's the access to the water that I have and through sports that really, I guess, got me thinking about this issue much more than others. And we started 12 years ago, and especially in Asia, was not a topic at all. It's just because people don't touch the water here, don't use it, don't appreciate it, don't recreate in the way that we might have done in the West. So they don't see it out of sight, out of mind, and it's just not something they they thought about. But now that's changing, luckily. And when you say we started 12 years ago, that's the Ocean Recovery Alliance? Yes, that's my NGO. So I've done a few different projects and work before that. I actually used to be in finance and outdoor media, and I'm really more of an entrepreneur. So when you think about our NGO, what I'm really doing is entrepreneuring environmental solutions and programs. In every program we do, whether it's with kids or with a corporate or with a government, we have to restart and raise funny money for that one program. So it's like little startups all along the way. The, the challenge for an NGO is you don't have anything to sell. You're not selling a product. You're not making revenue. So 
every time you do that, you need to get some kind of funding and support and sponsorship to run that program of outreach or education or solution for recycling or packaging, whatever it is that keeps life interesting, but it's also challenging, especially in Asia where donating to the environment is not so popular. It's usually for other causes. The foundation system out here in terms of family offices is very opaque and not as developed as the West. And so it's always tricky being in the right place because I can see things more than most other people who are in the West on a daily basis in the region, but also don't have the funding uh, mechanisms to really grow as fast here. So just one of the challenges of the space. A lot of your initiatives depend on philanthropy, on donations from groups in Asia to support them. There, We get them globally. So we know from foundations, from multilaterals, we've done work with UNEP, the UN Environment, or the World Bank, and individuals. But we don't seek small money individual donations, really. We appreciate them. But we do have to go corporates. Sometimes they like to do employee engagement programs for getting their employees out and volunteering and doing things. But yes, we do have to find it from somewhere. And that's a challenge, especially when we go into other countries, which are not, they're developing countries and they're not, they have their own money. So that means we need to find external money to run those things on those programs. But we made it work over 12 years. So it's been happening. What is it about plastic that's so damaging to the ocean? Well, I think it's got to remember, it's not just the ocean. We always see the images of a turtle with a straw on his nose or in the little seahorse and a whale when you open its stomach. Years ago, when the whales would die and happen to land on the beach, they were so smelly and they bloated that people, I mean, literally they blew them up or they buried them and they never inspected what was inside the stomach. So I'm sure that even 30 40 years ago, they had plastic in their stomachs. We just never looked for it. But one interesting thing to remember is there's no body count in the ocean for dead animals. It's impossible to see any animal that dies when it's, unless it happens to land on the beach, which is probably 0.001%. Otherwise, they sink and they get eaten by the other animals in the ecosystem. And that's nature. But I would propose that there's many, many more animals out there that have died as a result of plastic that we just don't know about. But the point here is that it's not just the ocean. Every land animal will eat plastic if they can get it in their mouth. Giraffes, goats, dogs, pigs, birds, anything that sees a color or smells a bit of food or thinks it looks like food will mistakenly try to eat it. And That means that this obviously is a huge land problem, and all plastic comes from land, except for a bit from the fishing industry. So the ocean is just the recipient of our bad activities, but all of those are on land. In what we do in our cities, how we manage our waste, how we recover it, how we package things, how we sell products, all of that is land-based. So the challenge in the early days of our work is how do you migrate this ocean story into the inland communities who maybe don't even think about the ocean or don't care about the ocean. They don't recreate at the ocean. They've never been on a holiday to the ocean. It's not their space. The brands think it's not their space. I'm not a tourism company. I don't have a resort on the ocean. It's not my zone. It took a few years for people to understand that this was everyone's problem. And the reason why it is such a problem is because plastic simply doesn't go away unless you burn it. So polymers are great for everything they're meant for. They're lightweight, durable, flexible, moldable, colorful. But all those things are the exact reasons why it's so hard to recycle them, recapture them, gather them. And remember, in the big rain, big storms, which much of the world has, this material floats very quickly, very easily, and it moves away so it can get lost very easily down the drain, down the streets, down the rivers. And we've never put focus on the bleeding rivers and the bleeding creeks ever. Even still today, we're not really doing that very well. And that's where it all joins to the ocean. So a lot of this can be saved upstream. And that's where there are a lot of things that we work on today. 
That was one of my questions. Is that how a lot of this plastic ends up in the ocean is kind of run off from streets or getting into rivers and then into the ocean eventually? It's not just the practice of dumping plastic into the ocean? Yeah, I'd say 99.999% is that reason. You don't get people at the beach blatantly just throwing their garbage into the ocean when they're done with their picnic. Maybe it used to be that way, and then, but pe- not really anymore. There were times when the U.S. used to dump our waste offshore. New York took barges out in the 60s and before that and dumped in the middle of the ocean. So it still did happen, but it's happened in some countries a little bit. A good example, I've heard in places in Asia, maybe not so much today, but only five or eight years ago, a truck driver who's meant to be the waste hauler for a hotel, many hotels all book this waste hauler. And they say, please take our garbage to the landfill. Well, the landfill is 30 kilometers away. Fuel is expensive. Traffic is bad. It takes him two or three hours to get to the landfill. So instead, he parks his truck, has a nap, waits for dark, goes to a ravine, which is only three kilometers away, and just dumps the trash in the ravine. That happens a lot. Then the rains come. And then the brands, logos of the garbage that came from the hotel, washes up on the beach right in front of the hotel a few days later. (laughs) That happens. But not as much as it used to. So when you think about the loss, the Western countries contain the waste much better than other developing countries, just because they have the infrastructure and the money, the resources, they have the trucks, they have the curbside pick up. So in California, in the U.S., you don't see that. We have landfills in the U.S. The biggest competition to recycling is landfill because landfill is a giant hole and all you need is a truck to drive there, dump it in a hole, cover it up. You don't need many employees. You don't need innovation. You don't need anything. But for recycling, you've got to compete against that. You have to get the waste. You have to sort it, clean it, turn it into its different families and types, process it, and then sell it again and then hope that the value and the margin you can get on that is more than the guy who is getting the tipping fee or the dumping fee who just sits there and runs the landfill. That is another big challenge. But in many countries, they don't have that containment. And 40% of the world's waste is estimated to be burned just in your front or backyard, of roughly. And that has, that's huge. No one is talking about this today. And this is a giant issue for three reasons. Immediate respiratory problems. If you go to the Philippines or some countries in Asia, as soon as it's dark, because it's illegal to burn trash, as soon as it's dark, all you smell is burning plastic because the, it's dark enough to hide your burning. Because they're not giant bonfires. They're just local neighborhood burn. But that you've got to get rid of your waste because there's no trucks that come by and, and do it for you. But then that puts the toxins in the air which is where we're getting all the toxin movement into the food chain. And it causes carbon black from the soot. And that's very bad for global warming because the soot attracts heat in the atmosphere. And and that's a challenge we all have to really address. Even before we get into the recycling discussion, we got to slow the flow of what's coming out of the rivers. And that's why we create our Global Alert app to do just that. Yeah, I was looking at that. That's a way for people to identify and and alert where there are trash hotspots, right? Right. We made this a number of years ago, partly funded by the World Bank. It's even in Spanish, but it's a bit like ways for traffic. So it lets you report hotspots of trash, not a single piece like a candy bar wrapper because a minister of sewers or tourism isn't going to come pick up a candy wrapper. But if you show them a swath of trash along a river bank or flowing in a river on a creek side or on a coastline, Then there's reason with GPS points, you can't hide from that anymore. You can go into any meeting with any stakeholder group and say, hey, this is where my eighth grade class reported that there's all these hotspots along our watershed. We need to go clean that. So it's a way to engage the community. You don't need thousands of people to do it. You could have two people on a bike and a boat and uh, walking in a watershed area of two or three miles and report three times a month, it's already more data than most people ever get. And that's enough to then create a story of maybe putting up a boom or a net or a catchment device in that creek or inlet, outlet, so that you do slow the flow. 
Then you've cleaned the water, the surface water. The local community then builds trust in what you're doing. So trust is a key thing that we have to rebuild here, both for recycling and for just keeping a waterway clean. Then people don't want to repollute it. And then you can look upstream and say, hey, where did that come from? I know it's not downstream, but it's upstream. Who's it from? What is it? Maybe we can prevent it. Maybe we can recycle it. Maybe we can avoid it. But this gets to that next discussion. We've had reports in 40 countries, more than 40 countries. But the thing is with our app, we are not big enough and able to connect to every single watershed manager on the planet. So if someone in a country does a report, it's up to them to talk to someone in the watershed who's a stakeholder, could be an NGO, university, rotary club, company, government, that says, hey, we're reporting on these spots and here they are. Can you help us arrange weekly, monthly, daily, whatever it is, cleanups and maybe management of that water through a boom and a catchment device? Pretty powerful if we start using it the right way. No, it's amazing. Tell me if I'm thinking about this right, but the other, when I think about the plastic problem and kind of the need to figure out recycling specifically, my understanding is the production of virgin plastic is pretty impactful from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint globally. You probably know this better than I do, but it's, what is it, like 7% of total greenhouse gas emissions annually are due to producing virgin plastic, Right. which is, if I just think about kind of motivations for solving the plastic problem and improving recycling, that feels like a good one as well. Yeah. Recycling, most studies show that if you use recycled content in your package or your product, you can save 70 to 90 percent energy versus the energy used to extract and refine virgin plastic. So the movement to recycled content is huge for a climate benefit. Obviously, the real benefit is you're getting it out of the environment, getting it out of the water, So there's not health problems and fishing problems and tourism and ecosystem problems. I think the U.S. EPA has a number that if you use recycled content, you actually save 1.8 times the amount of CO2. So there's a positive impact from using recycled content. So the challenge is how to get that feedstock, that waste material back into the recycling stream. And in today's waste system, when we put all of our garbage in one big bag, Of course, not everyone does exactly like that, but most of the world does. With all the food waste and all of the messy things, it's simply too expensive, too costly. No one wants to pay the labor for it to unsort and unscramble that omelet to put it into its own parts. And many of the old recycling facilities around the world were okay for the last many decades dealing with paper and glass and metal. You can have magnets and The paper can be mulch and you can dry it out. But plastic came along in so many, many, many forms. In fact, there's over 40,000 types of plastic that all live in seven families, but they all have different melting points, different chemicals, different colors. And you can't just put them all in one batch and then make a new iPhone cover or a new toy. You have to sort them. And that's the costly, difficult part. So when you talked about design and technology, designing for standardization of materials is a huge thing because the more that the products are standardized, the easier it is to not have to sort them as much and put them in the right family so they can be reused. And standardization of colors and everything will make a big difference. That's where a lot of people are pushing for, but it's tough when the brands all want differentiation, different size, different shape, different color, different functionality. So that's one of our challenges. Yeah, you're saying you really have to influence all the way upstream when people are designing products in the first place and making those choices about materials and colors and things. And if we could all agree on one color of toy or one color of food packaging or something or and one material type, that would make this problem a lot easier. Yeah, that's going to be super relevant. There's a couple design angles here that are interesting too. Of people years ago had challenged Coke to not use a red bottle cap because red colors, red, orange, yellows are all known to in the ocean world that animals eat bright colors. They think it's a fish. I mean, not a fish, but they think it's food. 
it's a dead animal, dead shrimp. It's a bright color means eat me. Just designing for colors can make an ecosystem difference. But the other thing is with bioplastics, and we do support bioplastic as a way to remove, get away from the virgin petroleum type of plastic. Of course, they all have some issues, but if you take a biomaterial product and some people say, well, they don't biodegrade as fast as they should, and it takes two years. But if it's two years, that's a lot better than 400 years, which is the existing product with petroleum. But the problem is the recyclers and the consumers often don't know which materials are actually bio. And so when you mix the bio product in with the non-bio product, it can mess up the batch and contaminate the batch for recycling. Some biomaterial is meant to be recycled, but people don't often know which one is meant to be recycled and which one is meant to be composted. So, you know, just labeling and color coordination or something that can help us all understand these different types will be very important. Yeah. What a mess. <laughs> it is a mess. So... <laughs> I'm a lifelong recycler and I've always tried to really improve my personal habits around plastic usage and recycling and stuff. But there's been so much in the media recently about how recycling is kind of a myth and it's not doing nearly what sort of we all hope it's doing. And Greenpeace put out this report, I think late last year saying, or sometime recently saying, yeah, basically that recycling just isn't working. And I guess this is why, right? It's just so complicated to actually get the materials separated enough to get value out of them. Right. Well, there's a few price vectors there that are not working. And it's sad that people are saying that because that's our only really hope. We can alleviate, we can tax, we can reduce a bit, but that's not going to solve any of the problem of all the inventory and all the stuff that we still have to use. So the price mechanisms that are challenging is, one is tipping fees. If it's free to throw your garbage away, then there's no incentive at all for anyone to collect it or um, spend any money to recover it. So case in point, I live in Hong Kong. It's still, they've been debating for 15 years, it's still free for everyone to throw away all of their garbage anywhere. So there's zero incentive to sort it and gather it. In the US, we have so much land that it's just a lot of states, a lot of waste is exported to different states because it's cheaper to landfill in a state that only charges 25 a ton versus a state that charges 200 a ton. It's worth driving eight hours to go do that. That is a problem. Another problem is subsidies on oil and gas production. That means it's just cheaper to make virgin material because there's subsidies there that the recycling industry doesn't have. So when you put all these things together, it's tough. Most mayors in the world have signed on to you know, CO2 reductions. They want to be clean, green city with less CO2 impact. So they put some solar up. Maybe they have wind. Maybe they have geothermal. Do some building efficiency projects, improve a little bit on the transport. That's about it. They rarely talk about waste and landfills. But landfills and organics create methane, and that's 23 times more powerful than CO2. So that should be the number one place that we're looking at to make a big reduction in any given city. And if you weed out the organics from the plastic and vice versa, both of those feedstocks now have value, much more value than they had otherwise. So the organics can be dealt with in the right way for the soil or gasification, and the plastic now doesn't have to be cleaned and sorted, and that omelet doesn't have to be re-scrambled in such a difficult manner. Then you can really drive the scale on recycling. And that's where we really have to be thinking about this, because if we poo-poo the uh, failure of recycling in the past, which in a way is not true, because anything can be recycled, the problem is the system is not set up properly to, to get all those families together again in that economies of scale manner to be able to make it happen. So your response to Greenpeace and others saying recycling isn't worth the effort is it's our only option. They offer no solution that I've ever seen except for don't use it. And if we don't use it, we won't be able to run any of our lives. There's not one person on the planet that can survive without plastic in some way, shape or form, I would argue. 
So we got to be realists about this. You need it for food. Food waste in itself is such a big problem with 30 to 40% just wasted either at the shipment level in production supply chain, but also in the household restaurant level. And if you can't preserve food, which you can't do very well with glass, paper, metal, then we have a problem on the food side. People need to eat. You don't want to grow crops and then have it be wasted in shipment. We need this material for the time being until something else is invented. And so now what we're really trying to promote is how do we get that material to be useful in its second life, its third life, its fourth life, fifth life, whatever it is, but it's got to keep circulating. Here, this is the whole circular economy angle. What do you think about reuse of plastic containers? So I think when we talk about recycling, we're talking about melting down and yes. creating new products with the same material again, but actually taking my detergent bottle, cleaning it, filling it with detergent again and selling it again. Is that a viable solution and something we should be pursuing? Com completely. So there's no one solution anywhere that's going to solve everything. But Tupperware called me one time a few years ago because at that time, India was came out with a very quick edict that said, we're banning all plastic. And everyone was in shock. And Tupperware has been in business for decades. And <laughs> they said, what can we do? Our, all of our products are plastic. And I said, yeah, but what you're doing is incredibly useful and positive because if someone uses their and they do use this for this purpose in india and everywhere else to carry your lunch for 20 years one container imagine 20 years of saving from styrofoam lunch boxes which they still use in hong kong and many other places 365 days a year times 20 styrofoam lunch boxes for one person can be saved from one tupperware reusable container you can't just dismiss plastic forever. And if you can have reuse models, perfectly great thing, because if one piece can save 100 from being used, that's already a big scale of improvement. And then maybe at the end of 100, it gets ground up and becomes a piece of furniture or it becomes a car part. There's so many new ways with innovation and design that can take recycled content into new products. It's just that a lot of brands aren't thinking that way yet. Yeah, let's use plastic for what it's really good at, lasting a long time, and use it for products that need to last a long time. Right. Last question about the recycling process. Isn't it true that plastic can only be recycled a certain number of times? The polymer chains get shorter every time you recycle it, and after a few cycles, it's not a useful product anymore? Right. So that's a good question. So when I talked about going into the second life, third life, fourth life, in fact, the reincarnation coming from Asia and Buddhism, the reincarnation of that product. At least the material should have a second life, third life, fourth life. In some cases, you can't take a plastic bottle and turn it exactly into a plastic bottle again. Technically, it's very possible these days and much more possible because there's more machinery and equipment to do that. But if you don't have the right equipment, then you can't do it because of food grade packaging laws and cleanliness and purity. But you can still take that product and change it to be a fabric or a different part of a different product. Going into concrete now or asphalt, you can take mixed dirty plastic, mixed, meaning you don't have to sort it, process it in a certain way, but not melting or burning, and get it in as an additive to make concrete stronger and lighter and asphalt roads stronger, less potholes, less wear and tear on tires. This is coming very, very fast and it's very interesting because it's a way to absorb and make value from all the stuff that never will get recycled in a normal, 90% of the normal world today. Oh, wow. Another area that's coming very fast is chemical recycling or advanced recycling, which is basically repolymerization of the dirty stuff. So you, again, take out all the clean, recyclable material, and that's mechanically recycled, which is what we were just talking about. But you can take the dirtier plastic, which won't get sent into a plastic bottle factory, and reliquify it, essentially reliquify it, refine it back into a polymer, clean it, and then that new polymer comes out as the quality of a virgin polymer. That is pretty amazing. So... Those machines are huge. They're multi hundred million dollar, two billion dollar machines. France just announced a billion dollar plant. 
They need a lot of material. They need trade to happen. This is something we haven't talked about, but trade and a global circular economy. But if they can do that with all of the dirtier stuff, then we take the clean stuff and mechanically and the other goes to chemical recycling. There's some options there. Some people believe that it takes too much energy and it does this, but it's all being innovated. It's all being done by multi-billion dollar companies. They'll probably find a way to do this, but it's not going to be a machine that you can put in your village. These are giant, big, super WALL-E type machines, <laughs> but it will, there'll be space for those in different hubs of the world. On the topic of machines, you told me when we met earlier that you have some ideas about where hardware can play a role in solving this whole problem. I'd love if you could talk about that a little bit here. Sure. So going from the machines and the WALL-E size big city pieces of equipment, a lot of big companies go around the world saying, oh, I can make a contract with that big city and that big city and that big city. The problem is waste is distributed, just like solar and wind. It only happens where there is wind or sun, which isn't everywhere. But waste is everywhere because people are everywhere. And waste is in every village, in every town, in every community. And most of these smaller communities and towns do not have the facilities, the capacity, the technology to even do semi-processing just to get into the supply chain of recycling. So if your uh, village of 200, 800, 1,000 people at least had a grinding machine or a shredding machine, you could take all the plastic bottles and thick, rigid material, which really is just air wrapped in a rigid piece of covering, which is horrible for waste maximization and efficiency. They grind that up. Now, all of a sudden, the size of their material is this big, but the weight is the same. But now they can create a huge, it, we've done studies, is eight to nine times you can densify the material if you have a shredder. And if you do some hand sorting, all of a sudden you might have 20 kilos or 100 kilos of the same material just by this one machine, which can now be sold quite easily to the entrepreneur or the recycler in the next bigger city who says, oh, now you have 100 kilos. I'm willing to buy that from you because I don't have to do all that work of scrambling, the re-scrambling the omelet and taking away. You just did it. I'm willing to pay for it. But no one today has access into that. So what we really need is thousands, millions of small shredding machines, grinding machines, compressing machines that can help the smaller communities of the world get into the demand cycle, which is quite big now, and the recycled content supply chain. So we don't need big machinery and equipment that goes into a big city. Most big cities already have their own sort of solutions, whether they're good or bad, they have them. And big opportunity here. Do the machines exist? And it's just about the business model? It's all off the shelf. Okay. It's all off the shelf. So it's just about financing them. It's just fine. And financing is a loose term because it's cheap in a relative sense, but it's so cheap that no one's even looking at it in a way. It's like, there's no VC is going to do anything in this space because it's, I mean, it's way too little of a price. But a village chief who needs $800 or $5,000 to get a couple machines, he doesn't have eight or $5,000. How is he going to get it? So there's a big funding gap that exists right now. But once that happens, you do you, a lot of benefits start happening. You've cleaned the community. The community is engaged on this kind of material. There's jobs for sorting. And there's great manufacturing sales opportunity for countries that can make good equipment and export it. What we don't need is the giant, super duper high tech machines from the West that are just too expensive for most of these places and too big at scale for the communities. Of course, they can be very effective at the large aggregator, large processor end to make really good quality final product of feedstock and pellets. But you don't need that kind of technology and equipment to be on the ground, localized at all the communities around the world. Thinking about the future, what do you think the long-term solution looks like? Do you believe there's a world in our future where we don't have plastic at all? 
or do you think it's more about really solving the recycling problem? Where do you think we're headed? A hundred percent impossible to have a world without plastic unless we all don't be cavemen again. There's not one thing we can do in our daily lives without it. I'm like, okay, there might be a few, but in general, cannot. Cars, medical, food, computers. So we're going to have it. Okay, maybe a world without petroleum-based plastics. Yeah, single use. Or single use plastic, sure. Yeah, or single use. There's a lot of silly plastic, stupid plastic that are all packaging and you don't need to have a lunchbox with styrofoam and a plastic bag and a plastic spoon and come on. So all of that can be weeded away, but that might be 20% of the overall global inventory. We're still going to have 80% that we've got to deal with, even if it's a chair that's been around 20 years. So I think there's huge opportunity in this space. So a lot of your listeners might know about the UN Plastic Treaty that is being negotiated right now. It's due to be finished by the end of 2024. The feeling of this treaty, obviously, is meant to reduce plastic pollution. So 190 countries have signed on to at least say that they want a treaty to reduce pollution. A lot of the themes and discussion is around reduction and punitive measures, taxes, bans, but reuse, alternative use, different use. But that's only going to solve some parts of the problem, not a lot of it. And recycling has to be a huge, basically, reboot. We need a big reboot for recycling around the world in, in a way that we recover material and allow it to be traded. And this is contrary to what a lot of people are talking about. They think that the trade of plastic is the trade of waste. In the older days, meaning even five years ago, there was illicit trade. There's corruption. Sometimes the plastic that was meant for recycling was mixed with other bad batches of stuff. But that is a lot of that has been alleviated because of the eyeballs and focus on this issue in the last few years, even with COVID. A lot of the illicit recyclers who were the buyers of material in different countries went out of business because they just simply couldn't get material and survive during COVID. So a lot of the illicitness is gone. Regulations are improved. But that doesn't mean we should lock our borders down and not have trade. So a circular economy, we have to think about, a lot of people don't really think about this, is it meant for my county only? Is it meant for materials in my state or is it meant for materials globally around the whole world? And we would argue that for plastic, it really needs to be global. Because if you force every single country to have its own circular economy, its own processing, its own big equipment, its own manufacturing to absorb material into, to use again, that will never happen. They're just not the resources. There's too much replication. That's not taking advantage of competitiveness, competitive advantages. So we need to do what we're talking about, getting all these smaller machines and equipment into communities that can get into this space and get into the supply chain, even at a pre and semi-processing level. So that's a space to watch. That makes sense. And to tie it back to something you said earlier, if I understand right, France, I think you said France has this billion dollar facility now to do, did you call it chemical recycling? Chemical and advanced recycling, yes. Chemical and advanced recycling. With a good trade system, we could get enough material from around the world to that facility to make that make sense. That's exactly right. Okay, I have a few last closing questions that I ask everybody. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of our planet and why? I am cautiously optimistic. All right. <laughs> There's a lot of the technologies, actually all the technologies, many people say this, that could solve all of our problems already exist. They're out there. The problem is we can't find them. We can't get them scaled. We can't get them funded. The policies don't allow them to be used. So I think there's going to be a bit of pain in fluctuation of everything we're seeing today. The weather, the dryness, the storms, the problems, food, but there's a lot of new things coming out and there's a lot of opportunity. This is going to be the next revolution, really, the environmental revolution for sure, because it will take that to really make all the changes we need. So this is a giant time for entrepreneurs and the environmental space. Just my word of advice would be, please 
think globally when you're creating these technologies and exporting and use for everyone, not just trying to sell it into your own local domestic market. That's one of the problems. Is a lot of people aren't thinking of how to get it into markets all around the world that need to use it. Good advice. It is a global problem after all. Who is one other company or person doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you? So what I see is an amazing opportunity, and I think I mentioned this before, is the ability to use mixed dirty plastic. To be able to turn that into concrete and be an additive that makes it stronger, lighter, insulated, and even more valuable than it was as mixed plastic for a long-term product is a company called CRDC out of Costa Rica, and the product is called Resonate with an 8 at the end. This, to me, is taking the world by storm. It's still relatively small, but it's highly developed. It's not just grinding some plastic together and trying to mix it with concrete because that doesn't work. They don't bind. The way this is done, it is incredibly binding and it does make it stronger. So to bring 3 or 5% weight differential in concrete moved around the world, that's a big transport and fuel savings. So when you actually, here's an interesting factoid, if you took all of the world's plastic made every year, which is 370 million tons, roughly, that's in a dead weight, not blown out into all the products that it becomes. And you threw that all into the world's cement industry use annually, it would only be 3% by weight. So everything technically could be absorbed in concrete and no one would even flinch at it. To me, that's a giant opportunity. So watch the space on that one. Yeah, and if I understand right, one of the big values of that, it turns something that's otherwise not really useful or has almost zero value, this mixed plastic, that into a valuable, it creates a demand for that. Right, and imagine uh, low-cost housing. You can build, put this into concrete blocks. The local community can collect it. You can get a whole engagement program going on getting that material as long as it's processed the right way to then be able to bind with a concrete, which is what this technology has the patents for. But it's, again, the interesting thing, it uses machinery and equipment that is off the shelf. So it's easy enough to be able to put this into communities around the world and localize the both collection and the use of it, as long as people taught the right method to do it. But you can get the machines and equipment from any country. And uh, that's pretty amazing. Super cool. Yeah, I love that. What advice do you have for someone who isn't working in climate or the environmental space today, but wants to do something to help? Well, all hands on deck. I mean, there's so many things you could do, even if it's donating money, if it's volunteering, if it's reading up about some causes that you're interested in. It might not be plastic, it might be water, it might be animals. We're losing ecosystems and species very rapidly. We really need everyone to be aware of something that they like. Pick something that you like and that you want to protect and learn about it. Go to a lecture, go to a podcast like this, go to a museum or wherever it is to learn more about it and then be an advocate. You don't have to be a mean about it. You don't have to force people to do it. But if you have a few facts and figures and bring it up in a good way, you can inspire young and old. And I think that messaging is very important for all of us to be able to do. Awesome. Doug, that was really fun. I learned a lot and I'm really impressed by kind of the scope of the work you're doing and all the impact you've had over your career. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dylan. Look forward to see you again. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.